Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the second Call Up Summit. Here in uh, very hot Nuremberg, uh, we decided to leave the black things on the windows because that gives us better chances of not dying of heat stroke during the day. Um, it also makes the room very cozy and bar-like, which is kind of fitting since you see over there all the Call Up Taster outfit we have. Um, including the demo stations and the uh, noise, which has now been slightly reduced. In fact, um, heralds the Collab Summit and some of the things we want to talk about, since it um, comes, comes from the Power8 server we have with us. So there's an actual live Power8 machine here. Um, it runs Collab. Um, over Wi-Fi, we're connecting those little demo stations that you see there, so you can actually live try Colab on power as it runs. All of this is real, it is live, it is, there's no, you know, um, it, it, live demos have a certain reputation in the tech industry. We go for it anyway, um, because that's who we are. So, a few logistics to, to begin with. Um, you see those wonderful red bottles. Um, they are for, I was told, everyone who has signed up to summit.colab.org. Um, sign up there and you get a bottle. And in fact, spread the word about that as well. We also encourage you, everyone, grab lanyards, run around with them, um, and invite people in so people know where to go to um, get all the knowledge about Colab. The program for today is mostly on the technical but also some legal side. Um, we um, have Aaron, who will be talking to us um, shortly in, um, uh, in the tech realm. Aaron, our CTO, Aaron Seigel. Um, many of you who've been in the KDE world as well know him rather well. Um, he's going to give you an idea of where we are technically and where things are going. And um, after that, I'm very, very happy that we can welcome Dr. Meyer from um, IBM, Director of Hardware Research in Böblingen, and he will talk to us about power, but power the future. Um, so I asked him um, to also make it a little bit more technical for this audience today, um, because, well, you know, this is a geek event. We're once more hosting it together with um, the OpenSUSE community, so I figured tech is good. Um, and I hope we hear all about nanotechnology and nanotubes and, and all the problems that you have when you try to make things smaller and faster and, you know, have them all, you know, run even faster. I mean, those who have followed the hardware world have seen that Intel has now started to reduce the clock rate on its chips again um, over the past year. So we're hitting physical limits, like actual physical barriers in, in the way we've designed these things. So now we need to find better and new ways. And that's exactly what we will hear about. So I'm very, very happy that you're here with us. Thank you very much. Um, and also, uh, ah, Julian Höppner is also here with us um, to give us a legal perspective, which, I mean, we didn't plan it this way, but especially today seems to have a certain undercurrent. Since he's going to talk about EU legislation, um, we all know that uh, Safe Harbor is um, dead. Privacy Shield is about to die, kind of, like there's a certain expectation that it won't really last very long. Um, and of course today, uh, social media um, are more interesting than on many other days, given that um, the whole Brexit referendum has surprised quite a few bookkeepers. Um, so everything is up in the air. The question is, where will the pieces fall? Um, we hope to give you some answers on that, at least from the things we can see and we know, um, and to talk about building the technology that actually can give you confidence in collaboration back. Um, and that requires the entire spectrum, right? From the hardware, you need hardware that is open, transparent, powerful, but actually something that you can verify, build yourself, innovate upon. That's the power story. You need the operating systems. I mean, we are here with the ZUSA conference. ZUSA runs perfectly on power, always has, right? ZUSA actually um, has its origins more in that field than on the Intel hardware. 
So um, Zuse and Red Hat both um, run on power perfectly well. Um, and then, of course, you have the solution on top, which is Cola, obviously. So that's kind of the, 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 the program for the day. Hans de Rath will then close it off with um, a niche market perspective. Um, one of our long-standing partners from the Netherlands, he in fact has worked with us also in the healthcare sector and, and, and has been working a lot on the previous Collab Summit for those of you who were there, um, because he organized or was one of the organizers of the Open Zuzu conference in The Hague, where we co-located this for the last time. Um, that's it. And since we feel that's kind of enough in terms of talks, right, we figure we take this outside since the weather is wonderful. I mean, up until last week, I, I typically made the joke that um, this summer is kind of one of the hardest winters we've seen in a while. Um, but uh, this week that seems to have changed very radically. Um, so let's make the best of that and actually have some barbecue and beer outside. Um, I mean, it's a wonderful, lovely area there. So from four o'clock, Lisha, right? Four o'clock. From four o'clock onward, are you all invited as our guests to just, you know, have some sausages, some meat, some beer, um, enjoy life, you know, talk to each other. Um, and when you want to cool off a little bit, you just come back in and um, play around with Colab. There's all these demonstrations. Also, ask every one of us at any point in time about things that you are interested in. I mean, we have a large part of the Colab team here, in fact. Um, quite a few people who are very uh, significant contributors, I should say, starting from Aaron, of course, who will speak shortly, but um, then Jeroen, just wave once, please, is our senior architect. He is the guy who thinks about how the puzzle pieces go together. Mads, behind him, is our technical team manager. Um, we have Christian, all the way in the back. Um, exactly. Uh, who is leading our desktop client, so um, currently, of course, contact based on KDE PIM, but we're gonna hear the exciting things about Cube. Um, I don't, shouldn't ask you from stage, but may, maybe you, we even get to see something during these days, that'd be wonderful, um, because Cube has really developed nicely. Um, we have quite a few things to show already, and um, those of you who have not subscribed to his blog, I would recommend that you do, or just go on colab.org and go in the blog section where you find it aggregated. Alec, of course, as well, is, is also here. We didn't even say hello yet. Um, you must have snuck in when, when I wasn't paying attention. Um, who's working for, on, on the web client, Runcube. And of course, Runcube Next is also something that for us is very important. So there's a few things that we have to talk about on the technical side. And therefore, I hope that all of you will enjoy this and will spend this day with us get interactive, engage with us, collaborate with us. I mean, for us, this is an interactive thing, right? I mean, this is not supposed to be a, we stand here all day and just give long speeches, but a, let's get into some sort of exchange with each other. So therefore, please, you know, just ask questions, be interactive, um, get engaged and collaborate. Thank you very much. All right, once Aaron is ready, which I'm sure he's going to be in a moment, I think we'll just switch straight over. Great, so let me just get this presentation back to slide one. Great, so we're gonna be talking about, uh, yes, I thought one or, one or two people might find that uh, subtitle a bit 
humorous. So we're going to be talking about uh, initially the technical future and roadmap of uh, Colab. We did this at the last summit as well, gave, tried to give everybody an idea of where we were going um, and where we were. Um, and so this is becoming a regular thing at the summit, which is good. Um, and hopefully we'll give you a, a very nice idea of, of where we are uh, now as well. Let me just see if I can see if this baby works. Oh, it does. Beautiful. Because now I can roam. <clears throat> Great. So the technical roadmap this year, um, it was interesting at last year our, when we talked about our, what we were planning technically, we talked a lot about features and where we're moving the technology. Um, and this year, the presentation is, we're going to be talking about features as well and what we're doing new, but we're actually going to be starting with um, the results of a lot of work that we put in in 2015, as well as this year, that have started to produce um, noticeable results. Uh, so we're going to start with the, the topic of releasing Colab. When is it available? How is it made available? In the past, we had a community edition and an enterprise edition. And the community edition was released approximately every six months. Um, the enterprise edition would eventually would usually then take one of those uh, or some point in time version of that and try and stabilize it. Um, there was some flux in, in when things became available and, and, and how. So we moved um, to a very nice fabricator based system. Uh, to propel our development along and organize it a lot more. And that has allowed us to actually sit down and go, how would we really want to release this um, in a more reliable and a more predictable fashion? So we actually now have a release schedule which we've been working on internally and the Colab 16 release is actually the first one that has um, participated, if you will, in this release schedule. So this is what Colab, uh, the, the release, kind of rhythm is going to look like from here on um, in uh, for, for Colab. So in January, you're going to get a new major release of Colab. This January, we released Colab 16, and that had um, significant new um, technology previews. And that's when we'll be putting in major new, uh, uh, major new components, major new features, um, introducing things that are even still a little experimental, but we want our user base and our customers to be able to actually play with it and, and help us direct the, the, um, the future for those items as well. So for instance, in January, we released with uh, the uh, IMAP proxy and filter, Guam, um, as well as a technical preview of uh, collaborative editing. Um, so this version is, comes out in January every year and public access for everyone uh, to participate in, install, use it, and feedback to us. In March, June-ish, this will vary depending on the amount of effort necessary, but between January and this point, uh, the entire team and community will be working on bringing in you know, feedback, bug reports, et cetera. So with the Colab 16 release in January, we immediately have got you know, people that said, oh, I installed it in this way, or I did this upgrade, and this didn't quite work as I expected, and so bug reports came in. This is fantastic. Um, they were addressed. Um, and so we work, we've been working incrementally towards um, the ability to release a stability update. Um, so this would be a 16.1, or if necessary, a 16.2. And this will happen again every year. These releases, we'll actually stamp them as this one is now recommended for production use. If you go to docs.colab.org right now and go to the uh, deployment and installation documentation, you'll see there what the recommended version is for uh, production deployments. Right now that's Colab Enterprise 14. When we uh, release the 16.1 um, update, then that will probably update to recommended for production is 16.1. This gives us the ability to put out a major release, not risk your data with a brand new release, but allow us to engage in a feedback cycle to get to the point where we had in the past done with call-up enterprise um, processes to something that we can put into production um, and then provide that wonderful guarantee of five years of extended support. And it's at this point that commercial support for that version begins as well. Throughout that entire time, feature development and improvements in performance, targeting new hardware platforms, new operating systems, will be continuously ongoing. In September or October, uh, there'll be a feature freeze 
Um, at which point we go, okay, anything that is essentially there and available right now, we're going to work on targeting that for the major release in January. And it loops back around. Um, so anybody who wants to get anything in the next major version of Colab, it needs to be available and ready, um, or at least in, in a state that you could say, yeah, we can, we can get this uh, in, in good shape by January. We're gonna make those decisions in September, October. Um, and then from this point forward, we focus on stability and performance of the new features as well as existing ones. We work on things such as integration, packaging, um, upgrade paths, et cetera. So we just focus on polishing so we can loop back around to January and do it all over again. And this will create a nice rhythm that we, that we can follow together. So then we have platform support, which goes along hand in hand with this development cycle. And we'll see how um, in a moment here, uh, very visually. Um, one thing that we've tried to do is define a little more explicitly what platforms we are uh, supporting at what level. So this year we introduced Winterfell, which is a kind of a rolling release uh, build version of Colab that anyone in the community, and we use it as well, of course, at Colab Systems, but anyone can take um, Colab and target it to a given platform, whether that's hardware or, or software operating system. Um, but we wanted to make it very clear what we're targeting, what we're aiming for, um, just to bring some, again, predictability and, and um, clarity for users of Colab. So we've settled on a tiered support strategy, um, which actually maps very closely, it's actually not really changing much of what we've done, we're just actually being able to communicate it now. So we've got the three tiers. Um, we've got primary, and these are platforms that we say there'll be packages on release day. That's what we focus on in Colab Systems to make sure that there are good, high quality packages for those platforms. Uh, we have alternate platforms. Um, these are platforms that we guarantee there will be availability for. So if you're on that platform, you go, okay, I'm going to get a version of 16.1 with commercial support available for my platform, but there'll be a time delay. It will lag behind the, the, um, the primary platforms. And finally, experimental. And this is the realm of, of the Winterfell and whatnot. Um, and this, there are no guarantees. They may be available, they may be dropped, and this will be at the feedback and participation of both, um, you know, people inside and outside of Colab Systems. This is the community um, movement area. And between these three tiers, over time, uh, operating systems and hardware platforms can move. So something that is ex alternate today may become primary tomorrow. And this is completely going to be done in response to the demand um, from our user base. What are people actually using? We want to be able to focus our time and our efforts and our energy in producing good quality results that people are actually going to use versus try and guess what people actually want to use. Um, so we're gonna start with hardware. Um, and normally we, I don't think have talked very much about hardware in the past with Colab. Um, our, our primary platform remains Intel x86 for now, because that's just where we, where we are. But um, as Georg mentioned earlier, and as you can still hear that high-pitched whine in the background, um, we have a new alternate uh, platform that we're working on polishing so that it will very soon actually end up in the primary uh, target. And that is Power8. Um, this is a very exciting platform for us, um, not only in part because we get to work with the likes of IBM and a lot of ISVs, such as Avnet, um, et cetera, but it is a really exciting hardware platform in terms of openness, which really meshes with our, um, our ideals and our way of looking at the world. Um, but it's also serious hardware for serious deployment. Um, we're working with one of the uh, IBM ISVs, um, or, or uh, IBM partners, sorry, um, Avnet, to define three different profiles of power rate hardware that you'll be able to just order with Colab already installed, certified to run Colab, so you can just say, I need a Colab box, or I need 10 Colab boxes, um, put in the right SKU, IBM will ship them to you, completely done, you can slot them into your racks and away you go. Um, so this is a very exciting um, uh, development for us. Um, and as soon as we've got the packages to where we go, yeah, these are rock solid deployment ready, this will be moving from the alternate to the primary uh, tier. And that really shows how that tiering helps us um, communicate clearly when things are ready and, and how things can move around. 
Um, we still have uh, experimental packages for ARM. Um, you can install it. We've done this. We've actually demoed it before at uh, FOSDEM. Um, but this is an experimental platform. Uh, participation is, is more than welcome. Great. So onto the operating system. Um, this server uh, picture I find remarkably. I, it was the only um, non uh, encumbered image of a server I could find with a white background and it's like the ugliest thing ever. It's fantastic. So the operating system side, um, we retain our primary focus on Red Hat, RHEL and, and CentOS. In fact, the Power 8 box that's running right now is running Red Hat Enterprise Linux. This is where we focus our, our efforts on right now. Um, it is not our only um, target, however. We have as um, alternate, ooh, typo, um, as alternate um, operating systems at that level. Um, we have Debian, Ubuntu LTS. So these are platforms that we will be targeting. Um, again, with that time lag. Um, and then Docker with Kubernetes is another thing that we continue to work on and continue to make progress on. And I put that in as in, it's not really an operating system, I know, but it's a, a, a target platform. Um, and I expect one or more of these to move from alternate up to primary um, in the not so distant future. And again, this is really gonna be driven by um, demand and, and usage. Um, we've got a bunch of experimental um, operating systems right now. I'd love to see these move up to the alternate tier and then eventually maybe to the primary. Um, this includes uh, operating systems such as SUSE. We've been working with ClearOS. We're working to bring uh, Colab 16 with commercial support to Univention. Right now there's Enterprise 14 available on it. Um, and we're working on all, all of these to move them up to the, the alternate tier. But for now, this is where they live. So how does that actually work in, in, um, in practice? I'm going to show you a, as soon as I can find the, uh, uh, where's my mouse, there it is, aha. A spreadsheet, let's take a look at the spreadsheets. Ah, that's better. So this is a, a provisional spreadsheet, but it gives you an idea of how this, this um, the release rhythm with the platform targeting kind of works hand in hand. So as we have collab with Enterprise 14, um, in primary recommended production or for uh, production, um, call of 16 comes out, it is then stabilized and it becomes the recommended version for production. Enterprise 14 goes into long-term support for five years since the point it was released. 16 goes into primary usage. And then again, in January of 2017, we'll have the release of 17. We'll have the, um, the stabilization update of it, et cetera. So in this version of the, actually this is a version I've been playing with to see what it would look like to actually have um, every second year a enterprise release versus every year. Um, but then you can see how this, this filters down into the platforms. So Enterprise 14 is already available on Debian, CentOS, RHEL. So we've got all of our platforms covered. There's actually quite a few more down as we scroll down, but I won't bore you with every single platform. When Enterprise, or when uh, Collab 16 enters commercial support, then, again, it becomes recommended. We have the version of RHEL that we focus on. Um, and over time, uh, so when RHEL comes, uh, sorry, when the Enterprise, uh, or when Collab 17 comes out, then it does the same kind of dance where the packages become available. Collab 16 is available with long-term support, et cetera. And CentOS, the same thing. But you'll notice that with Debian, for instance, as a secondary platform, Oh, that's like doing it in a mirror, and it's awkward. So you can see that there's an expected time delay between delivery on our primary platforms and our secondary platforms. Um, this is simply a matter of prioritizing our resources um, and making sure that we can deliver good um, experiences to people. So, and you can also see where you know we have Debian 8, Jesse, and Debian 9 stretch, you can see a little bit of red over here, and I'm not gonna try to do the, the mouse dance again. You'll just have to trust me on this one. But, uh, oh, oh, I can scroll with this, apparently. Um, but what happens is when, as a secondary platform, when new versions of the operating system come out, there we go, while we, we will be providing support for those who already, already have, say, Colab uh, 16 on Debian 8, 
we will no longer be supporting new installations on that operating system. So we'll be following more closely the um, upstream rhythm of the, of the base platform. For our, our primary uh, platforms, we can continue to support multiple versions. That's no problem. And that's really about that, that again, that allocation of extra resources, allocation of extra time and care. So as we nail this down, this will actually be um, eventually shared with the world at large. And we're still experimenting with some of the, the finer details of it. But this gives you an idea of what we're uh, looking to uh, achieve. And our hope with that is that as our users and our community and our customers, this then gives you the ability to plan more effectively. And you go, okay, I know when this is gonna come. Um, I'm on Debian. I know that when 17 comes out, I'm gonna have to, yep, so Q2 will be the update to commercial support, and then probably Q3 I'll get it, right? And so we feel that by communicating these things clearly, um, it'll just make it a lot easier for people to plan. And for something like, um, uh, collaboration software and groupware, planning is absolutely key to making sure that um, things continue to run and work well. Okay, now we get to the exciting part. That's all the boring spreadsheets and, and, <laughs> and details of, of how we move from day to day. But uh, now we're going to take a look at the new capabilities that we're bringing to Colab um, currently and over the next year or so. This isn't absolutely everything. We have an internal um, technology plan that I think is about 70 something slides at the moment. Um, so I'm not gonna go through all 70 things, but these are kind of the highlights. So the first really big thing I think is we're gonna be taking the collaborative editing up to the next level. We had the technology preview in January. This is well received. Um, we've partnered with Colabora to bring their cloud suite, which is LibreOffice, um, on the server uh, to Colab. We're actually working right now um, on the integration glue between the two. And so if you've seen what we were able to do with Manticore, it'll be very, very similar. Where you click a file in your files area, you hit, you know, say edit it, and you get an editing session that you can then do right in your browser. I'm really excited about this. Um, it's actually, interestingly enough, one of the very nice reasons for having uh, a platform like Power8 around, because this is definitely going to, for companies that move to you know, self-hosting their own editing cloud, if you will, um, this is definitely going to increase the amount of, of horsepower and, and, and server resources you're going to need, and Power8 is really well suited to this. We also have um, a little bit of a revolution happening at the moment with um, the clients for access to Colab. Of course, with Colab, you can use Thunderbird or Outlook or your mobile apps of your choice uh, to access uh, Colab. But we also maintain uh, two client uh, applications so that you can experience Colab as we mean for you to do so with uh, all the features and all the integration. Currently, that is um, Roundcube One for the web client and Contact on the desktop. And while they've served us very, very well over that time, and we've been very happy to work with both the upstreams in both and be a major, um, in, in these two cases actually probably the primary um, uh, funder and sponsor of these projects and have great experiences there, we realized that we need to move on and provide a better experience on both. So we've undertaken Roundcube Next, um, while we still continue, of course, to maintain Roundcube One. Um, and Roundcube Next is, uh, I, we'll be talking about that actually tomorrow, yes, at 11, I believe it is, about both the clients. So I won't go too much detail. If you want to learn about what we're doing with these things, it's very exciting. Come to tomorrow's presentation. Um, Christian Molokov, who's sitting in the back there, is the lead developer on Cube, and he'll be presenting on that. Um, but in a nutshell, Roundcube Next is taking Roundcube and all the things we love about it um, and streamlining it. So it goes from a largely server-side rendered um, application with you know the typical PHP plus templates to a single page um, HTML5 based application that runs in your browser, no refreshes, not having to reload the the full HTML and everything every single time. Just the data that's necessary is going is going back and forth. Um, it's using a uh, or it's targeting a protocol called JMap, which we're working on with a number of companies right now, which is really great. It's a great example of open source software in action. Um, uh, we're working on both the server and the client side, so client side JavaScript library as well as server side implementations. Um, and what JMap does, it takes IMAP and makes it friendly to the web, in a nutshell. Um, so Roundcube Next will give us a much nicer experience, something that works on mobile a lot better, something that we can adapt 
to the needs of, of, our, of our customers and our users a lot easier. Cube, on the other hand, is our next generation desktop client. It will, we hope, uh, is our intention to be able to replace the usage of contact for people with, with uh, Colab. Um, it has a strong focus, as you'll find out tomorrow, on user experience. What is, you know, what are people actually trying to do and how can we get them there rather than cramming every possible feature into it. It also has a very strong emphasis on clean and elegant internal design. One of the issues that we've run into and our customers have run into, and our, I mean, everyone who's used contact knows, um, it's a very intricate beast. There's a lot of moving parts in it. Um, and if one of those moving parts doesn't move just right, things can go not as expected. And so we've really worked on simplifying that stack with Cube. So again, we'll have a much nicer user experience with Cube, but also something that is far more performant and uh, more robust. But again, come tomorrow to see it. You have to be able to see Cube in action tomorrow. Live demo, right? Yeah, he's smiling. <laughs> he loves doing the live demos. I mean, it's actually kind of interesting with this as well. Um, so while these aren't following that same rhythm that the server side is, we talked about earlier, um, we're doing some very neat things with, with the clients. So Cube, for instance, is available as an installable nightly. Um, you don't have to have anything else. We've been using Docker images. We're starting to experiment now with Flatpak. So you can just go and grab the nightly, one click install, see what we're doing, see what the madness is, is uh, what madness is afoot. So moving back to the server a bit, um, instant messaging is something that we're working on right now. Um, we asked ourselves, so we knew we wanted to provide presence and instant messaging um, into our stack. And in part, is to support the collaborative editing, such as Cloud Suite. So when you're editing, you want to be able to chat, you want to be able to send messages to each other, invitations, um, et cetera. And so instant messaging also can provide, interestingly enough, a, the negotiation backbone for things like WebRTC, which is where we're heading as well. Um, so we looked at it, instant messaging, we said, well, we have two different ways of doing it, right? One is we can grab an off-the-shelf, uh, tried and true Jabber server, eJabberD or Mongoose um, IM, for instance, um, and run with that, and we realized that they would be slightly difficult to provide the kind of integration that we wanted across the board. We want to use instant messaging not as, a, not as an add-on tack to the side, but as a, a core feature where it makes sense. Um, so we can easily integrate it everywhere we want, such as with collaborative editing. I want to be able to edit with you, chat with you on the side. I want to be able to, if you're logged into RoundCube, I want to be able to send you a message. Hey, can we edit this together? I would love to be able to do that right from my email. And all that requires a real-time communication backend. So we're bringing instant messaging um, to Colab. Uh, currently, our plan is to leverage a very exciting project called Phoenix Framework that comes with presence and chat built in. Um, and we're going to be providing a Jabber uh, API on top of that. So if you have a Jabber client, you can talk with each other, you can add people to your roster, but the server itself won't be talking uh, natively internally um, Jabber. And this will allow us to achieve far superior integration and, and powerful features that we want without being hemmed in by the issues with, with Jabber. Um, maybe a moderately controversial decision, but I think that if you look at everyone else in the world, um, they've either dropped instant messaging and Jabber altogether. The people that were using Jabber um, have either dropped it altogether and just said, we don't do IAM anymore, or they've just walked away from Jabber. And there's really good reasons for that. And if you'd like to chat about the technical, um, I'm here all day. I'll be actually outside with uh, barbecue and beer. So great time to talk about that. From the management side, um, we have been working up plans for a nice tool called PAC. Um, which is all in capital letters because it's a very nice acronym. But at the end of the day, what it is, is it's a management tool uh, for Colab that will really step up our, our game. And we're working to unify the web admin that you have if you're installing it locally with the um, ISP, ASP focused um, hosted management stuff. So we'll have one platform for all of that. Um, and we'll actually give you, if you're doing it in a hosted environment, you need to hook it into billing, et cetera. That will then be included as well. So you actually have the business side of it for hosting providers. Um, and if you're simply doing a on-site, this is my installation, you'll get as well a rather nicer tool. And we're developing all of these things, the UI of all these things together. And that's a really important thing to mention as well. So we've got a man with a camera in the back, Giles. Um, 
Yes, who is recording the event as we speak. Um, and he's really helping us to bring a, a harmonious visual design. Um, and he's been working with the developers to really discuss and, and, and define what kind of workflows do we want to embody. And that covers everything from around Cube Next to Cube right through to Pack. To me, that's very exciting. It's a huge step forward in design. Uh, some of the outsets, maybe a little bit smaller, um, but I thought I'd include it because it's interesting. Um, on our very near-term target here, we haven't actually begun the development of it, but we've, uh, Yerun has been working quite a bit on uh, proof of concept work and trying to work up a definition of what needs to be in there. And that is central authentication service, uh, authentication and authorization services for Colab. Um, this will replace a couple of small pieces within the guts of Colab, but most importantly, it'll give us one place of authentication that isn't welded directly to the backend implementation of, say, LDAP, um, giving some flexibility there. Opens the possibility for doing things such as um, third-party um, uh, authentication, which is really important for if you invite somebody, for instance, to an editing session, um, and you invite them from their you know, heaven forbid, their Google account, they can actually then say, yes, I am actually the person you send it to by authenticating through a third party. It allows us to do things such as multi-factor authentication uh, much more easily. We have a proof of concept now for multi-factor auth with current Colab, and it really helped us understand what we could do with a centralized um, authentication service. Um, and when, I, when we say central, we mean in terms of API and entry point. Like with everything in Colab, this will also be clusterable and distributed. So, that brings me to the end of the highlights, anyways, of what we're doing with Colab. We have a number of the Colab developers here and designers, so please feel free to come up and ask us about the things I didn't talk about or chat more about the things I did talk about. Um, but before I hand off immediately, are there any questions, comments from the, the lovely audience? So the question was, just for the camera and for everyone else, the question was, what about the upgrade path from one version of Colab to the next? So um, this is part of why having a release rhythm is, is important. It allows us to also know, okay, we have to, you know, these are the versions that are supported on which platform, so we need to make sure we have an upgrade path for our version X on platform Y, um, and therefore we know what we need to deliver. So I think it's really good to look at the example of Enterprise 14 to 16. Um, and Maz actually worked up the doc. I think you did the documentation for the, the upgrade, yeah. Um, so we really paid attention to the upgrade path, for instance, there. And the upgrade is extremely simple. You install the new packages. If it's a, you know, a small, self-contained local installation, you install the new packages. There's a small documented on docs.colab.org, um, which you can get to from the fancy, beautiful, new colab.org. Um, and there is the, it's all documented, the exact path you take. You just copy and paste the commands. Um, we really focus on making sure that data is, I mean, always back up, <laughs> right? But we have really focused on making sure that your data is, is absolutely sacred. Um, functionality needs to continue on, so it's a, like a zero disruption affair. You have a larger installation um, where you've got it spread across a cluster. Then, of course, the process is a little bit different um, in that you don't have just a single set of images to update but it's not that much different. You update the services, um, probably rebalance your cluster off to you know, left, upgrade right, balance over to right, upgrade left, rebalance. But again, same thing. It's really been designed um, and the documentation written to make sure that's a smooth experience. And that's something that we really are committed to doing with every commercially supported version going forward. We wanna make sure that at least between any two consecutive versions, there is a safe, reliable, and documented way of moving from one version to the other. And of course, as um, anyone who has commercial support, uh, you can freely choose to upgrade when and if you want, right? You get to pick that, that rhythm. Um, and so knowing when we release is also important, right? So you can then plan, okay, well, let's upgrade to you know, 17 in 2017. We'll skip 2016 for now because we're happy with where we are, whatever works for you. So, yep. And yeah, just, Again, just why this, this end, the release engineering is so important um, helps define all of this for us, right? That's a very good question, though. Any other queries and questions before I 
exit stage right. Good, thank you very much for your, your time and attention. And like I said, I'll be here for two days. So come up, talk to me, say hello, love to meet you all.